So with 80%, up to 80% of a, a final buyer's decision made before you even know the prospect's name or face or problem, and 44% of B2B buyers not wanting to speak to a rep at all, it's probably understandable that B2B sales has to evolve. The role of the sales professional has to evolve, change and adapt, probably more so to the buyer's demands than ever before. Things are changing quicker than it seems we can keep up. I'm delighted that Anthony Anarino has taken some time out of his day to share some of his thoughts and insights around the state of B2B sales, what we can start to do proactively about it. Not feel a victim around it, but embrace new opportunities, perhaps, that do exist. Um, for those who aren't familiar, Anthony has written many best-selling books around the topic of B2B sales. Leading Growth will be one of my favorites. There's also Elite Sales Strategies, which you can see behind my shoulder. And also his sales blog is full of articles around the change in shape uh, of B2B sales. A true leading voice in the space, and I'm delighted he joins us today. Uh, Anthony, good morning to you. How are, how are things where you are? Wonderful. We uh, took a nice long walk this morning in the cool air. We're in fall right now. Uh, you're in the UK, right? We are. So, so you guys have uh, four seasons, the wet season, the wet weeds season, the other two wet seasons. <laughs> that's, that's been my experience there. No, I mean, it's not far off. <laughs> uh, indeed, this weekend where I am right in the middle of the UK, we've just had a storm pass through and my city is now flooded. So it's it's obviously the wettest of the four wet seasons, but it's uh, we, we do try and get used to it. <laughs> so, Anthony, I mean, I mean, let's let's dive into uh, to our topics today. Broadly speaking, let's let's try and kick this off on a positive note. What, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in B2B sales? as it stands today? So the book Elite Sales Strategies is what I believe the future will look like for B2B sales. And what I mean by that is um, you're going to have to be an expert and an authority in what you do if people are going to buy from you. And this idea that we can think that we have this great company, we have these great solutions, and people are going to buy because of that, it's not going to be true. It's already proving not to be true. Uh, you can work for a great company. You can have great products and services and still lose because of the sales conversation. So what I tried to explain in that book was that all we have is a sales conversation. And the value of that conversation can be variable depending on your approach and, and how you what your methodologies look like. And that seems to be what's happening right now. I'm actually writing something today called uh, um, Profit or, let's see, what do I call this thing? Hang on. Profit or Perish. Yeah, because the people who are not going to make this change to a modern sales approach are going to have a much more difficult time. Uh, not just now, uh, but they're going to have a, every, everybody on earth is going to have a very different experience over the next 20 years. So over the next 20 years, uh, we're going to lose the baby boomers, mm. and that's 78 million people in the United States. There's no generation that can replace them. So the demand for everything is going to go down in the UK, in Italy, in France, in the United States, uh, almost everywhere on the earth. And the Chinese are the oldest people ever on earth, their generation. The 20 year old women there don't want to have any babies. So there's no replacement rate for them. And there's no replacement rate for us in the United States. We're down about 21%. So that means that right now, here's what I'll say about right now. Right now, how you sell is the variable. But in the future, it will be how you sell and what you sell because the demand is going to start going down as the baby boomers retire. You've got, uh, that's the largest generation any of us have ever had with nothing behind it. So uh, I think it's important that you figure out, I need to be a, a true ex person with the experience and the expertise to lead another person in a decision like this. And then in the future, it's also going to be, you're gonna have to have something that we need and what we want uh, because a lot of people are going to be disappearing. Uh, you're going to see there'll be fewer. Like right now, 
there's way too many of everything in every industry in the United States. But at some point, some of those people are no longer going to be necessary because the demand won't need it. So those companies are going to be in trouble in the future. So I think the opportunity is to start figuring out how to be incredibly consultative, mm -hmm. uh, have great experience, have the ability to be an expert. And I think those are the people that are going to win in the future. They win now too, by the way. So no, absolutely. And I guess selling the catalog doesn't, doesn't work anymore, does it? And I think no. what we hear, Anthony, and I'm sure you hear the same, is the insistence from certain industries and spaces where products might be heavily commoditized, where price is why we don't win business. That's the, that's the main reason. So therefore they absolve responsibility for anything about yeah. sales. Do you hear it's different in my industry and how do you overcome that? What would you say to sellers in heavily commoditized spaces, which I believe is your background? How oh, do yeah. you stand out in that space? How you sell is one of the best differentiators that someone has. When somebody says um, our industry is different, what you might do is ask them in what way? In what way? So your clients don't want you to create value for them. They don't want to work with an expert. They don't want to have somebody with the authority that could make sure that they have everything that they need to get through a buyer's journey and succeed. Uh, what part of that doesn't is not is different in your industry? Uh, because all of the ways that you can think about an industry, um, how you sell is just the decision that you make about what you do there. What they really mean is I'm afraid of change. And so this is one of the things that I actually wrote this money morning. Again, the people who go and tell other people that they need to change to get better results, and then they don't take their own advice, uh, that that's not somebody that's going to be an authority of anything. Like mm. that, that's just I'm afraid of change. If you go tell other people that they need to change. You should be one of those people that says we do it proactively and we don't have to have wait for somebody to come and tell us that the world changed. I had a couple people on LinkedIn recently tell me that nothing has changed in sales. And then I'm like, so you haven't heard about the Internet and uh, you don't know that everybody's got a website now. And all the things that you say in a, a sales conversation to start that meeting is they've already read it on your website. Like if, do you not know that? Like you did, you, you missed this. I don't know. Uh, everybody's got a website and now you see people like Gardner saying they're 80% through uh, because they're starting their di digital journey without us. That's just negligent on the sales force. I mean, you don't wait for somebody to decide that they're going to do something. You're proactively calling them because you believe you can help them with better results so there's no possible way for they can be 80% 80, 80 through if you call them first, because then you're there. And the data on this is pretty strong. 50% uh, buyer's remorse if you don't go a digital journey by yourself. So one out of two fails. Um, if you start with a salesperson, sale-led, that goes to 25%. So it, cut, it gets cut in half just by having a salesperson lead that. Mm. So these are the kinds of things when people say, uh, why is buying changing? Well, buying is changing because we need something other than what we can find on your website. We need real insights. We need real expertise. We need somebody who can make certain that we're going to get the results that we need because we have a lot of things uh, relying on this decision that we're making. So all of those things make it really hard for buyers. When salespeople say selling is hard, try being a buyer. It's hard too. Yeah, that's one of the points I wanted to pick up on, Anthony. It really sort of leapt off or into my ears when I was listening to Inaudible, um, that you suggest that buying has become more difficult. Yeah. Because yeah, we hear all the time, selling's harder, selling's harder. Actually, we think selling is kind of easier than it's ever been with more opportunity. It's harder to stand out. But I was really interested by your point of buying has become more difficult. And I just wonder if you could unpack that a little bit, because I think it's it's a, an interesting perspective. Yeah, there's a lot of things that they have to do. So one, they have this need right now for certainty. And so that means um, 
probably the HBR thing that uh, Brent Adamson wrote on sense making. They don't know what they don't know. And what we have now is people that go out and talk about their solution because they know the solution would be able to produce a result for them. But that's way after I do the sense making. So you have to have this conversation so people understand this. And my structures and the methodologies that I have built, uh, we start with teaching the client about what's going on in the environment that would have an impact on them. So we look for trends and forces that are going to cause people to have problems. So we never have to ask what's your problem because we already know what your problems are. And that's why we called you in the first place is because we believe that that would be true and that there's a better way to do something. So um, it's they also have to get consensus. Uh, they also have constraints financially. And so there's only so much that they can do. And so it's very hard to get a whole bunch of people to agree to the same thing. And we went from I'm probably a bit older than you, so you can see this is what happens. I, I wouldn't want to guess. <laughs> um, a little bit. What I used to sell, when I started selling, I was very young. I was probably, well, the first time I made cold calls, I was 15. By 18, I was calling on people face-to-face. -face, and there used to be a decision maker, one, one person in the room with me. And I would sit across from that person and I'd have a conversation with them. And they would, I would have a piece of paper with a contract on it and they would sign it with their own handwriting. And then I would take it back to my office. And then one day I showed up at a, a client site, um, finally got a chance to meet with them. And I walked into the conference room and there were 14 people there. And I, I thought I'm by myself. Like I didn't bring anybody with me. It's just me, 14 stakeholders. And they said, oh yeah, we're the task force on temporary staffing. And I was like, I don't even know what a task force is. Like, what <laughs> are they doing? And uh, fortunately, I figured out who the three people that I, I would call um, the center of gravity. There were three of them. And I realized that these are the people who were going to get what they wanted. So I decided at the end of that meeting to go meet each of them where they were. And then we came back together and the 14 people uh, we had two more meetings with them, and I won a $2 million deal um, by doing that. And then it started to see more and more, there's more people in the room, and then more people in the room. And so it's not just consensus on, um, let's say, the vertical. Like, I'm talking to human resources. Okay, so I'm talking to a bunch of HR people. Okay, great. And then it started to be, well, it's not only going to be HR, it's also going to be our operational team, and it's also going to be part of our finance team. And now I have all these other people in a room. That's the horizontal, right? So now I've got a bunch of other people. And it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, the number of people that they want to allow into this to try to get consensus. And it's almost impossible to get consensus. The more people you add, the more people have different opinions about mm -hmm. these things. Uh, I think it's really hard for buyers. So uh, I think we should, I think we should pity them in the way of like, give them the best help that you can give them because they have a hard job too. So, so help each, each stakeholder, I get each buying decision, buying unit, whatever you want to call it, task force. I, I might start using that. Um, yeah, I guess the, the stakeholders have individual needs. So therefore you have to be what the, the guide and point of trust for each of the stakeholders. So HR's needs, insights for them, operations, finance, insights relevant. To I, yeah, I, I, I tend to try to do uh, something that's broad enough to cover everybody. Mm. Uh, but sometimes it makes sense if you're going into, I was talking to a client yesterday about, I know where they are and uh, I know that their clients are never going to get the labor that they need just because I'm a, I'm an expert on labor. And uh, I knew that. And so I was just helping them with what I know because I do a lot of reading and I try to make sure that I'm on top of what's going on in the, in the mm. world. Mm. You, you mentioned earlier, and we're going to talk a little bit about leadership shortly, but as you mentioned it before, it's interesting to pick it up now about the neglect. It's, it's almost like sales teams are choosing to neglect what they see happening in front of them. And I wonder what, what you see of leadership either 
what they don't know and are scared to open up in terms of vulnerability, or if they are choosing neglect as a decision to go and make more calls, knock on more doors, drive more miles. These are things we've heard. Do go and do more of what doesn't work. Do you read Dave Brock stuff? Uh, I don't. Okay, yeah, you should probably go to uh, Partners in Excellence and uh, look up Dave, and then read what he wrote a couple of days ago about how many calls and how much cold outreach you have to do to get what people need to be able to reach their goals. The numbers are outrageous. It's just not anything that anybody can possibly do, and it's not going to work either. So what they want is technology. I don't know why they want more technology, but they have all the technology that they need, probably more. Um, I came back from California and I had two brain surgeries when I was 25. I went back into my family business. It was going $3 million a year. And just because I had a good mentor in Los Angeles when I was working for a larger staffing company, I grew it by $4.8 million by myself. So I took it from 3 million to 7.8 uh, as the only salesperson because of how I sold. So they want technology and they think that technology is going to solve this problem. And every year since we've started adding more technology, win rates are going down, quota attainment is going down, uh, buyers in, interpret us as being uh, time wasters. Mm -hmm. uh, the more we do something about technology, the worse our results are. So what I still believe, and you've got the book behind you, um, I believe it's just a conversation. And the person who does the best job helping the client by being very consultative, which means I'm gonna make sure they know what they need to know. I'm gonna make sure they understand what factors they should consider and how to weight those things. And I'm gonna spend a lot of time doing something like that. And I will just tell you that I think that that is what the future is gonna look like. And right now, when you talk to sales leaders, they're still looking for the, the magic button that they can push and, and hit their goals. So now they're trying uh, automated sequences. How long is that going to last? I mean, once you start doing this, uh, you're going to be spamming people, which is what they've been doing for a long time, yeah. especially when they give you that first one, you ignore it. They put the second one on top of it, then the ones underneath it. And then you get to like five or six of those. And pretty soon you're like, you're going to the spam filter. Like you're just going straight to the same filter because they're they're not doing this. They are afraid of making the change because many of the sales leaders in at least in the United States, they believe that the legacy approach that worked for them will work now. Now that's not true. And the reason that so many buyers say uh, we have a terrible experience with salespeople, which is why we're trying to have a salesperson free buying experience is because they don't create any value. And so they think you're just wasting our time and I'm not really learning all the things that I need to learn. And I think that that is what they're afraid of is making this shift to an insight-based methodology. And when we do this with companies that have a, that will actually adopt this, we get great results. The, the largest one that I did um, after our training uh, we we went up a, a billion dollars uh, in that company. So it was a billion dollar increase after the training. And now people believe, yes, I mean, now we know that this is a better way to sell and uh, it, it helped them. But I had a, a number of leaders who understood that the way that they've been selling, which was maybe 25 years uh, that they sold that way, it didn't work for them anymore. And then they met me and I showed them what level four value creation looked like and why you have to have an insight-based approach. And uh, that's what people really need to do right now. Technology is not coming to save us, I promise you. Mm. Yeah, and we do see it ourselves you know, when we when we work with the more traditional, let's say, stuck in the habits that have gotten to where they've got to. So we're not, we're not saying get rid of what worked, but how can we shift or introduce it later in the buyer's journey potentially? But we do see people looking for a silver bullet, like you mentioned about the funnels and the sequences, the hyper-personalized emails that are just, I don't even know who you are, so why on earth are you 
asking me how my trip to work was. It, it's just chaos. But people are absolving themselves of that responsibility, looking for the secret weapon, aren't they? And I think technology has to has to be part of the buying and selling process these days, but it's how we use it. And for me, it's how we constitute trust. We asked a team recently, how do you build trust? And they said, I get in front of them. They don't know who I am yet, but I get in front of them. That's what builds trust. But there's research that suggests that I think 88% of people trust online reputation as much as personal recommendation. So buyers are looking elsewhere for what constitutes trust these days. And I just wonder how you see that playing out in terms of reviews, reputation, personal stories, personal insights, not just hiding behind corporate banners. What's stopping people owning that that position? I would, uh, I would point to uh, Charles Green's uh, trusted advisor um, and, and uh, the trusted advisor, um, what is this? Charles H. Green, uh, go out and, and pick up his books. Um, Charlie's got uh, a, a, an actual equation. It's credibility times reliability times intimacy divided by your self-orientation. So uh, you can multiply all those things, but then you have to divide it by how self-oriented you are. So I will tell you in my business, no one knows the name of my business. You have no idea what the name of my business is. My clients don't have the name. They don't know what my business name is until they get an invoice. They have no idea. I've never said anything about my company. I've never told them how long we've been in business. All I ever do is focus directly on the client the whole time. And this is this. So this thing that Charlie does, credibility. I can't trust you if I don't believe what you're saying is true. Okay, so that's the first thing. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. Now you're not reliable. Intimacy means you understand and you know me, you know my business. Now, this is other things that buyers care about. They do complain that they know nothing about our business. They just don't know anything about our business at all. And that's business acumen that they're missing. But the intimacy means I know you and I understand what you need. And so that's part of it. And then the self-orientation is if you make anything about you, that means that you have to reduce that trust because it's about you. Now I have a company that's been trying to get me to renew with them and I'm not I'm not in a position to renew with them right now. And they keep asking me again and again what they can do to get me to give them money. But that's about them and it's not about me. They're trying to make it about me, but it's not about me. And I've explained, I'm not gonna do this right now because I have other things that I have to invest in. But they're making it about them. So now the trust comes down because I know that you want what you want and you don't want what I want because you should be wanting what I want. And after I tell you the story, you should know, okay, we probably just need to wait until he gets done with what he has to get done. But that's that's just the culture that that group mm -hmm. is. And I do think that Charlie's has got the, he's got the best thing. So it's credibility, reliability, multiply that by your um, intimacy and then divide it by your self-orientation. So the more self-oriented you are, the worse you're going to do. Let me tell you about our company. Let mm. us tell you about our clients. Let, them, let me tell you about our, that's all self-serving. It does nothing for the client. Yeah. When the first slide is how many years you've been in business, oh, who wants to know that? <laughs> it's like going on a, a date and saying, uh, I'd like to show you a picture of all of the women I dated before you. Uh, that probably isn't going to work. Like they hope you're interested in them, right? That's what the buyer wants. We want you to be interested in us, not yourself. And if you take care of us, then we might like you. That's how it tends to work. Yeah, it's it's a shift and a challenge for those who are used to going out with the briefcase full of brochures, isn't it? It's, it's it, are you finding it slower? Are buying a, 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 a sales cycles getting slower? At that that start point, do you find, or is is it as fast? Is it faster? What are you seeing around that? Because of this, it takes time to build that trust, right? So surely I that a, I have a, a a number of different businesses that I have uh, relationships with, um, some that I own, some that I work for, some that I do other things with, 
And I get to see that um, in my in my businesses, uh, we 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 don't have any slow sales cycle. It just isn't slow. Mm -hmm. It's not slow simply because we do so much work with the insights on the front end and the certainty and the confidence for them. And we're all experts. And because we're all experts, it's very easy for people to, to trust us. So that's it. And we work with, you know, some of the largest companies on our, like mm -hmm. SAP and stuff like that. Um, so we got, we've got the trust for the most part. Um, but when people don't have a good approach, they're getting stretched very long. I mean, the numbers keep getting longer every year. It's like sometimes growing by 25 or 30% a year, they're getting longer. But that's, I think, still because of the way that people are selling. And then part of it is the buyer. When you have to get consensus, it's going to take you long. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's part. We we can do our best to try to manage that. I will tell you, if I had a time machine to go back and there was only one decision maker, I like that a lot better. I don't want a DocuSign either. I want to actually have some. <laughs> you want a hundred. <laughs> yeah. So I can actually see you write it. That, yeah. that would be as much, a lot more fun. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how do we? Um, if you were if you were starting a, a fresh sales team now, and I'm sure you go into businesses and, and do this a lot, how are you setting them up for success in this changed space that we all operate in? You know, as an example, we we did um, an assessment of a sales team recently, and we found that only twenty percent of the sales force's time was focused on actual selling. There were, I think, you call this job job role scope creep pretty much in, in, in your books. And I think they were focused on admin. They were focused on chasing the invoices. They were focused on just meeting for meeting's sake. Uh, how much of a sales force's time should be focused on selling, do you think? Hmm. What would I say on that one? Hmm. It, it won't be. In the United States, the numbers 34% is what they say. Hmm. Now, you know, that means that there's some way more doing way more selling and some doing a lot less, right? Do you mean so, that's what it is or that's what it should be, the 34%? Is that what it is? <clears throat> that's what it is, but that's not what it should be. It should be um, something closer to 70%, in my opinion. Hmm. And if you take away a lot of the technology... And you take away a lot of the, the meetings that are not necessary and where there's nobody is actually getting anything that they need to, to be better. Uh, I think you can get a lot of that time back. I, I grew up in a time where um, I'll, I'll show you my CREM from that time. It's a index card that I would write a name and a phone number on, and then I would flip them over. And that was the extent of my technology. So there was nothing uh, nothing that I had to take care of before there was a CRM. So there's no CRM. There's nothing, no notes to put anything in. Everything was done in paper. And this is how I know for certain that technology is not the variable. Because if it was, everybody would be hitting their quotas. Mm. But nobody's hitting their quotas. I mean, it's very hard. And the win rates are so low. I think the one book that just came out said the average on enterprise is 17%. Well, an F RFP is about 12 and a half percent. So you're, you're like this close to just doing an RFP huh. and that's part of how they sell. And it's because you sell in this way that you make it more difficult for you to win. I think if you have one KPI and only one, I did this at a, a workshop in Chicago a couple of weeks ago. I asked this uh, woman that was sitting there, tell me the win rate for all 10 people on your team. She set them straight down without having to look at anything. She knows every single person's win rates. And then one of them was at 78 killer. And that I take that every day. Mm. Um, and then the person with the lowest was 28 but they just started. So they're just getting started with that. But she knew all of their names and all of their win rates because that's what she's looking for, their wins. But we're looking at everything except win rates. 
because effectiveness is hard. Technology is easy. You buy it, you install it, and you expect something to happen. But teaching a rep how to have a conversation to create value with a client is a little bit more difficult. And so they run away from that and try to find some other way to, to prove what you call the silver bullet. But it's, it's softer, isn't it? Relationships are much softer, whereas you can measure and the amount of phone calls you have, for example. You can measure the amount of face-to-face -face yeah. meetings you have of no consequence, but you're busy. Yeah, I'm busy. We hear it so often. I'm, if only I had a CRM, that would make me more effective. You know, back to your point of technology is not the answer. It's just a, it's an aid. But what we're putting into the tech isn't working. Um, and how much of this do you think does stem back to leadership? What's stopping people going rogue is it the whole oh they no one got fired for buying ibm sort of problem that we're in here i i, I i'll do what we've always done because no, I, I, I will tell you for certain there are people that are going rogue they they reach out to me and they tell me um i i don't use the approach that my client my company requires me to and then they call me eventually and they say my manager's going out on a call with me, what do I do? And I said, get duct tape, put them in the boot, right? Just lock them in there because the, all they can do is hurt you. Uh, and so they, they hide from their managers that they're using a, a modern approach because they know it works. And they, they confess that to me and, and make me promise to keep it a secret but they're not doing what their companies expects them to do because they know they're sitting across from somebody and they start talking about their company and they see that person start to just shake their head like, great, here we go again. Everybody's got a great company. Everybody's got a great solution. You're not helping me with anything. So I, th I think that you're going to see more people go rogue because mm. they show up on my platform and, make sure that they understand how to do the things that we talk about. And then they go out and get really successful. And make their managers look great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, isn't, isn't it a sad thing that and it sort of ties into the, one of the final points I wanted to touch on about, and you mentioned the word secret. You know, we've, we've heard it before where, and I'm going to use social media as an example. Again, not, not that it's the silver bullet, but I think it can certainly aid in what we're doing. We see people doing social media in secret. We see companies who don't have any policy, have no permission, have no structure, measures, KPIs, call it whatever you want, around social media fitting in and being a valid part of the sales toolkit. So they're doing it in secret. They're saying, well, I do an hour at the end of my day in my own time. It works. I get networked and I get conversations and I get people following up. People validate their decisions about me, but I'm doing it in secret. I, how are you overcoming this barrier to change in terms of upskilling to match where our buyers expect us to be? We have to be showing up where our buyers expect, but we're not getting that permission. So how, how do you overcome that from a leadership down perspective? In the United States, we, probably, we probably accept that a lot more than you do because we, we have a lot of people that can use uh, social Mm. There's a lot of activity there. I, I would tell you, um, I'm a phone guy, mm -hmm. uh, but if I can get in front of somebody on uh, LinkedIn and I can have something to share with them, I never ask for anything on LinkedIn. It's just not, it's not the right thing. No. I mean, the first rule of uh, social selling is don't sell. Yeah. So that's, social, so right? if yeah. You, yeah, if you, you're just having the introduction. And, and that works fine. And some of the people on my team just go out to LinkedIn and they connect with people that look like who we need to talk to. And uh, we don't we don't ask for anything. We just tell them we'll, we'll follow up at some point. And that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And that tends to work really well. But and people get so excited, people, don't they? The, the, I'm a content creator, so easy. Yeah, I mean, you're very active on social. Your content's great and people should... Should be should be following that, and I think, but it's a very purposeful. It, it has a very deliberate place, like you say. It's not selling. It's not flogging anything. But we're sat here, on different continents, chatting. 
because I, I see your content. I read your just, work. Just, just wait uh, until you see the pitch that goes for this <laughs> over the next two weeks. Yeah, go, yeah. it's going to go hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but I, I do think people see they get giddy because they see, it. and without the, the the training or positioning of where social fits, they almost see it as a stage to shout from, and it's not. Going back to that trust equation, it's self-orientation. They're just talking about themselves. They're not talking about the market or the value that they can add to people in their network. They just get a big network of anyone so they can shout yeah. into a void. It's not insight-led. And, and I think the power around that, we're doing some research at the moment into, uh, into the industrial market that suggests that buyers, the first port of call when looking for a new provider is their existing network. I'm going to look at my network to see who people are using. Yeah. And we can't ignore the strength of social networks in that respect. But like you say, this social is, selling. Don't sell. This is a an, an idea that's a lot older than people think it is. Yeah, this has been going on for a long time. When I try to explain what a trusted advisor it is, I tend to tell people to go to the Bible and just pick out any chapter and you're going to find a pharaoh who has a Moses, or you're going to find a king, you know, that has a, 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 a an advisor because they're going into war and, and all of these sort of things. That's the oldest thing on earth. And then finding out what other people did and that it worked out for them, that's old. Like this is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Who do you know that I can trust to do mm -hmm. this thing? And th so it's not new. All we did was digitize it. Yes. That, that's always been going on. It's yeah. just digitized. It's always been trust. It's just the way we, yeah. like I say, the way we constitute trust has changed. You I always want to be the uh, salesperson when somebody, you know, when somebody would say like, Rob's my guy, go to Rob. That's it. Like, they're just going to tell you, just go to Rob, Rob will take care of you. Hmm. Or if it's a woman like to listen to Susan, take her, like, just take my advice, go to Susan. And they do that because they want to help that person that helped them and they trust them. And that means that you can trust them. And that, that kind of thing still happens on social too. Mm. It, it removes some of the difficulty in buying as well, I guess. There's a lot of people that say, I'm looking for this. And then other people say, these are the people you should consider. Yeah, exactly that. That just yeah. happens in a digital sense. Yeah, it's not the silver bullet. That's just the platform where it's happening. So what yeah, I'm, uh, conveying is that we're still human, and we're we still act like humans. Um, we've done this a lot of these things for a very long time. Mm -hmm. There's been experts for a very long time. There's been trusted advisors for a very long time. There have been uh, referrals for a very long time. All these things are still true, no matter where we put. Them. The principles are always the same, right? The way we communicate them has, has changed. And I think sellers have to catch up. Organizations and leadership have to catch up with how your buyer buys. And I think that's it's a real challenge, but also I think an, an exciting opportunity because, you know, as a segue into your next work, which I'm hoping you're going to talk about in a moment, we, we, de we need a bit of positivity, don't we? <laughs> I think we, we do need to avoid negative influences perhaps. And I, and I think... That's the yeah. topic of your of your new work. So, so do tell us about that. Cause it's um it's exciting to see. For uh, a long time ago, I was uh, angry and negative, and I decided to remove all of the sources of negativity, which for me started with politics. Uh, so I'm uh, post political now. I've been post political for a long time, so I'm not going to argue with anybody about anything because there's no reason to. <laughs> Uh, the book is called The Negativity Fast, and uh, this is what you might need to know <clears throat> if you want to feel more positive more of the time and less negative most of the time. And uh, this is this has been uh, something I wanted to do for a long time. But when I moved from uh, one publisher to another publisher, I asked at the beginning of our relationship, will you let me write this book? And they said, yeah, we'll let you write that book. So I got to write this book. Uh, it's one of my favorites. Um, I think it's going to do good work for other people. I just hung up with Jeffrey Gittimer. Uh, and uh, he has been reading the book and he says it's my best book. So that's a nice uh, compliment. 
from a guy who's written a lot of books. Mm. And uh, I hope this does uh, help people just feel better after all of the stuff that we've been through over the last couple of years. It's been a challenging time for many. I think it's uh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to help a lot of people, I'm sure. Interesting that you're not post-political because they're all the same, aren't they? <laughs> Left or right, they're all the same. <laughs> but let's not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, it's a noisy I, space. I have them all turned off, so there's a lot more better things to do with my time. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, listen, Anthony, uh, it, it, it's been a pleasure chatting to you. And, and where can we see more about the blog? I mean, obviously, as I said, it's the sales blog. What's the website address? How can we connect? Where can we see more about uh, the work that you do? It's thesalesblog.com. <laughs> and of course, LinkedIn is a good place to connect with me. Of course. Absolutely. And, and the content you share is super helpful and insightful, as we'd expect. Well, thank um, you. Appreciate that. And yeah, keep up the good work. And I'm looking forward to the, the new work that's coming out as well. So listen, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking about the state of B2B um, and the opportunities that we're faced with. Uh, and yeah, let's uh, let's stay connected and hopefully pick this up again in a few, yeah. in a few months. Good stuff. Anthony, yeah, thank, you. thank you very much, sir. Take care. Thank you.